may have seen on the internet, I then took a toilet break in the bush, which they captured. It's very kind of them. I'm sure you all enjoyed it. And then um, I was basically shouting, has anyone got CO2? People were going past. Luckily for me, my knight in shining armour in the form of Beck Keat, Rebecca Keat, one of my rivals, just leapt leant behind, grabbed hers, threw it to me, says, Chrissy, I owe you one. Uh, sorry, Chrissy, you owe me one. <laughs> off, off you go. And um, I, you know, used the CO2 and off I went. But, you know, it was absolutely amazing what Beck did. She's not a teammate. I wouldn't even have considered her really a friend before I'd met her once. She didn't have to do it for me. And it was a real gesture of true sportsmanship. And I'm really grateful to her and I mean we've been in touch since and um, yeah I mean she's a, she's a she's a true friend now and I, I really am grateful for everything that that she did um, back on the bike I made up for lost time relatively <coughs> quickly um, and went into the lead at about 130 k okay? and then just never looked back I never like to physically look back when I'm racing but I didn't I just powered powered on um, I managed to put six or seven minutes in between myself and, and the second girl that was Yvonne Van Klerken um, going into the run. The first 10 <coughs> kilometers, I didn't actually feel that good. I'd had a, a stomach issues for, for, well, since actually the start of the race. So I was feeling a bit dehydrated. I wasn't sure that my, that my body was going to hold out. So I certainly wasn't confident in the victory at that point. So. I think I was very, very, very focused, more focused than many people have seen me before on that first 10K. And then I started to feel a lot stronger. I went through the half in 125, which was uh, good for me. Um, and I mean, I didn't have a target time necessarily. I knew that I was capable of around, I was hoping two, 256 was what I was you know, hoping for. Anything sub three, obviously, you know, I'd, be, I'd be pleased with. Especially in those conditions, someone told me that it hit 108 in the energy lab, so that's on the tarmac. But it, yeah, I mean, it was incredibly hot and a lot hotter than last year. Um, I guess I knew I had the victory when it was about 30, um, about 30k um, into the into the run, the last last 10k. Although it does, it sounds like a lot to you know shorter course athletes for an Ironman, the last 10k or for me. It, it, doesn't seem like so much um, and when I knew then I had like a, a 10 15 minute gap on a barn and I, I was confident that my body was going to hold out and then I really enjoyed the, the last 10 or, or 12k and to win has absolutely blown me away I I went in wanting so desperately to win um, but to, to actually come home and raise Union Jack um, still brings tears to my eyes, it really does. It was, it's overwhelming, it's amazing, it's exhilarating. I had my family on the finish line, which made it so, so special to me. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm so incredibly proud to be double world champion and to be a British double world champion, you know, is, is even better. And, and the party continued. Um, right up until the finish line at midnight and it has to be seen to be believed and it's really quite amazing and very inspirational to stand there and cheer people on and watch them and put medals around their neck and see the kind of joy, elation, perseverance and everything in their faces. It's really quite fantastic and it, you know, it makes me incredibly pleased and proud to, to do, you know, to do this, um, to do this sport. Um, that's me and my mum. <laughs> um, this is the pre-race nutrition very, very quickly. Um, that's what I had uh, the day before the race. We cut out fibre, or I cut out caffeine seven days before, and then take it in tablet form and in gels on race day. Um, and I cut out fibre three days before. So that's what I had the day before. That's my breakfast, which I have before every Ironman. Um, it's not a lot. It's important for me to get fat in, obviously, um, because I have quite a low body fat, the, uh, the extra fat to burn is very useful. And then this is my race nutrition. I actually bought some packets and you can take some away. This is um, <coughs> my sponsor, but I do use it. I use um, three of these in two bottles, or th 
three in each bottle, two bottles on the bike, plus chocolate bar, two caffeinated gels on the bike, and then six caffeinated gels, one every 25 minutes on the run. Um, it's not that much, and you know doing an Ironman you're going to be in calorie deficit. Of course you are. Um, you don't, I mean, you, you've got to practice. I know I know from, from experience, from training and from racing, what I can cope with and what works for me, what works for me won't work for you. Um, so you have to, you know, you just have to try and see. People often make the error of, of taking too much on, and that's a big mistake. The other mistake I see is people taking salt tablets, especially in hot conditions, and you get excessive salt, and then it really causes some stomach problems. So watch out for the salt tablets, especially if your drinks and your gels contain um, contain salt. Um, my life has changed. Obviously, it's incredibly, incredibly busy, um, but it's absolutely <coughs> fantastic. I, you know, I have a great manager that takes a lot of the weight off my shoulders and juggles more balls than I ever could. I've got some fantastic sponsors. I, I won't go into them. They're all on my website, but they've been really, really super supportive. I'll mention two local ones that have given me an incredible amount of um, product support, and that's here, Physio for Life, and Sigma Sport um, in Hampton Wick have, have been really, really great, and they're local, and they've been really supportive. Um, what I've been really pleased about um, is the amount of media coverage this year. Now, I know, it, know it doesn't seem like a lot to you, Last year it was minimal, this year it's grown, and what I've been really pleased about is that since I've got back to London, it's been pretty much back to back. I've done local TV, two channels, radio, um, my um, regional TV stations. I met with the Guardian yesterday with Channel 5. I'm doing a full day with Trans World Sport tomorrow. I did an Observer feature, How You Got Your Body which is sure it's going to be very entertaining. But I guess what I'm trying to say, all joking aside, is we've never had a British Ironman champion. So the lack of media interest is to be expected. But it's up to me to change that. And it's only by me being proactive, getting myself out there, that we can slowly, slowly change it. It won't happen overnight. No, they're not going to have double page spreads in the Daily Mail, thank the Lord, about Ironman. Um, God bless Nathan. Um, but it's, um, you know, it, in all seriousness, it's going to be slowly, slowly, incremental steps. But I will do what I can to be the best role model ambassador that you have ever seen for British triathlon. And, you know, I can assure you of that. And I have been doing what I can, and I will do what I can to get triathlon, Ironman, women in sport, British sport, into the media, here and, and overseas. And that's something I see as a very important role. That I that I have as as a pro and as uh, and as a as a world champion, and following on from that is my opportunity to motivate and inspire people. I really enjoy giving talks like this. I really do. They're not a chore for me. Um, I love being able to touch people's lives in a way that I never thought possible, and um, I will continue to do what I can. Also, you know, to to do that and like I said, be a role model. Um, for the sport. Um, plans and goals very quickly. Um, I know many of you have int are interested in this um, and it's been covered quite a lot in the media about me changing um, coaches and, and, and leaving the team. Um, much of what has been said is, is, is very accurate but I'll just reiterate it again here that the team is transforming itself into a development team that helps development athletes. They want every athlete on the team to have the same manager and the same sponsors. That works for some people, especially uh, athletes that are on the lower levels that haven't got their own sponsors, haven't got management. I wasn't prepared to, to leave my manager and leave um, my loyal and financially supportive sponsors. Unfortunately, that meant I had to give up my coach. Um, I wish I could have stayed with Brett. He's an amazing coach. He's brought me so much success, and I'm incredibly grateful to him. But I couldn't fit within their structure anymore, and I've got to accept that. I don't, 
And, you know, there's no bitterness or resentment. I've got to move on. Doors close, others open. I get a new coach. Can I do it without breath? I don't know, but I'll give it a bloody best shot I can. You know, I've taken risks before, taken chances, and, um, you know, I'll just give it 100% to my new coach and um, hopefully go on to win many, many, many more titles. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic, I'm really positive. Yes, it's a shame, but yes, I will carry with me the, you know, the lessons, the lessons I've learned. Um, in terms of races, the, the schedule will look much the same as it did this year. I'll have a, 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 a spring Ironman, a midsummer Ironman, and then Kona. Probably do three seventy point threes and some uh, perhaps Alpe d'Huez again, and maybe um, maybe some Olympic distances just for training. Um, we haven't, I haven't signed race contracts yet, so I can't say what races I'm going to do. It'll probably be New Zealand or Australia. There's um, most likely to be Frankfurt, but there, you know, there are other options. Um, and then, of course, um, Kona. Um, I'll just get, leave the last word for my um, the, the development work. You know, everyone knows that it's a huge passion of mine. It's what I've worked in for for a number of years. Um, I'm really, really grateful to you, and I and I do honestly mean that for paying five, you know, five quid to come and listen to me ramble. Um, we've managed to raise what is it? It's five, five, four, five hundred quid. Well, you guys coming tonight and talk before we raise four hundred pounds. Yeah. There's a guy from another ten pound for all of it, and five two four seven and said they'll put some money to So I mean that's raised, a, you know, a considerable amount of money, yeah. and I'm gonna give that to Macmillan Cancer Support um, because it's an issue that's very close um, to my heart personally and I've got a number of uh, family friends that are suffering from cancer at the moment. Um, I also auctioned my race glasses for breast cancer, expected $600 which we're really pleased about. I'm auctioning my frame which you should all be aware of, aware of but not this one um, but the one I raced on in Frankfurt, Alpe d'Huez, Timberman. It's just the frame, it's been signed, I've kept the components, sorry. But it's going to go on, uh, it'll go on eBay at some point in the next few months. And I'm raising money, I don't know if many of you are aware, for the charity that I roll across the line for. It's a guy called John Blaze. He suffered from a motor neuron disease called ALS. And I'm going to do what I can to raise awareness about the disease and raise money to go into research. At the moment there's no money going into research, into treatment for the disease. So. Um, with his parents, we're going to auction the frame in for, for his foundation and, and for ALS um, research. Um, so yeah, so I will do. I mean, I will do what I can to help. Obviously, my time is limited, but it's something that I'm incredibly <coughs> passionate about. And when triathlon is over, sport for development, setting up a development-related sports foundation is what I want to do. Um, it's going to take time. Um, but that's, yeah, I mean, that's uh, an aspiration for uh, uh, the future. But in the meantime, what I want to do is carry on training, get faster, get stronger. I know I can do both. Um, bring home as many, many titles as I possibly can. And like I said, just try and be the best role model for the sport in Britain that, that I can possibly be. Um, just finish off by saying sorry for going over time. I know it's late. Um, Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it. I really do. It's great to be able to come and meet some um, some British triathletes. Um, thanks to the guys here again for everything they've done for me, but also for hosting this, and to, you know to my friends, family, and sponsors that have that have supported me so much. Um, you can ask me anything you like within reason. The marriage proposals are great, um, and then I have got like my my sponsors. One of them, one of the main clothing sponsors, Tear, they send me so much. So I've just got a lot of stuff. Well, not a lot, actually, because the others um, got most of it. <laughs> Except for the little pink bikini. That didn't seem to go. I don't think it's very good for Fox Hill, is it? <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's a few bits. So feel free to just grab what you want at the end. And like I said, just take some of this if you want to try it. It's there to be, um, there to be tried. Um, but yeah, first of all... Before signing um, this project, a uh, protest no, uh, question. <laughs> <laughs>
lighter components. Yeah, like specifically aero bars. Lighter aero bars yeah. or having aero bars on your lighter aero bars. Um, weight's an issue for some courses, but you know, as if for very hilly courses, weight is more of an issue. A flat course like Hawaii, Western Australia. I'm talking Ironman here, but you know, thank you. Um, Olympic distance. It doesn't really make that much difference. The power's in the engine. So on a flatter course, no, weight doesn't make that much difference. If you're climbing, yeah, it, 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 it does. But, you know, it, I think that investing more time in, in the training is more important than investing the money in getting the lightest components possible. How exact, how exact is your bike setup? Do you talk about your cleats and things like that? How exact do you have to maintain that? I've never had a professional bike set up. I've gone solely on feel. I know what feels comfortable. I can feel if my cleat is slightly out of whack because you know my knee will start to hurt and I know, oh, it's because the cleat's slightly out. So everything on my bike is set up just so that I feel comfortable whilst, yeah, paying consideration to aerodynamics. Um, but yeah, you've got to set your bike up as it, you know, as it suits you, um, rather than to a, you know, kind of a, a textbook. Have you been sick this year? <laughs> like, aside from when I got drunk last week. Yeah. <laughs> Apart from that, yeah. Um, sick or injured? Like not injured. No, no. Sick from be from training. No. You haven't had any loss of training. I've not had, I've not missed one training day this year, um, which is, um, I mean, obviously my physiology has a lot to do with it, um, but it's down to the training and having a coach, Brett, that could see when I needed a rest. I could walk on full side and he would know she's tired, she needs a rest without me even knowing, you know, so he was, you know. He, um, he was my eyes and ears when I, I, I wasn't as intuitive about, about myself. Um, but no, I haven't 